Everybody talks about the dignity of dying. Today I want to talk about the dignity of living. I'm a product guy. We designed everything from Gatorade bottles to robotic surgical systems. And the things that we buy and surround ourselves with really influence how we think, feel, and behave. So what I want to talk to you about first is what is the one thing that you own that you absolutely love? When you use it, it makes you feel great. You actually brag about it. Or maybe it's seamless. You don't even know you're using it because you know you've bought some bad design and bad design barks. And good design, in many cases, is just seamless. It's just there. So let me show you what I love. I never thought that I would be showing you a thermometer, excuse me, a thermostat from my home. I don't know how many people here own a Nest thermometer or a thermostat, but it's one of the best design products that I own. Right down to the screwdriver that has the magnetic tip that holds those little microscopic screws because you always drop them. My watch, I love my watch. Not because it's a great timepiece, but because how it makes me feel. I don't know whether you're a James Bond fan, but I am. And every time I slip on this Seamaster Omega watch that you've seen in so many James Bond movies, it just makes me feel like Q handed me my watch, you know? Bryce, Bryce Bond, you know? I love it. But with both of these products that I love, there's an emotional connection. The Nest solves some of my problems because it thinks for itself. I didn't have to program it. So it eliminated a pain point of always messing around. Is it too hot in the house? Is it too cold in the house? So the best design product that you own has some kind of an emotional connection. And it may just sound right. It doesn't sound cheap. It doesn't sound weird. It's just perfect. And in fact, when we were designing a vitro retinal surgical system, you, you listen to the surgeons and they say, you know, the sounds that we hear tell us about the performance of the surgery itself. There's so much content in sound. Smell. How many people here can smell Johnson & Johnson baby powder right now, right? <laughs> it's been 19 years since I put a little bit of that white powder on my six-foot-tall son's little butt, but I can still smell it. The persistence in my memory of that is so powerful. Now, what can a designer do about taste? I'm not talking about cooking, but I can influence how you taste things. I could run a little test, I could get two Domino pizzas, and before I come into the room to run a taste test, I'm going to take one, leave it in the box, take the other one, and put it on a really nice dance platter. I'm going to put a little sprig of parsley in there, you know, and maybe a little rosemary, decorate it up, and bring it in and run a taste test. And I'll guarantee you the majority of you will say that the one on the dance platter tastes significantly better than the one out of the box. So how does that happen? Well, it's the experience of eating. And you've seen this too. You've gone to great restaurants, the environment was beautiful, the service was impeccable, and when you come out and say, what'd you eat? I, I forget, but I love it. I love the restaurant. It was all of those consumer touch points that really influenced how you perceive the taste. Now, this is not my boat, but I would love to have this boat. <laughs> and I don't care whether you like boating or not, you would like to have a ride in this boat. <laughs> I know that. The best design things that really influence how we feel about ourselves, that we, you know, the products and the things. There's a, a certain beauty to those great designs, and there's a rhythm, and the way the material and the textures and the form all come together. It's just right. And in fact, if someone said, Bryce, I want you to fine tune the industrial design of this boat, I'd say, no, it's done. It's perfect. Touch. Man, I think touch is such a potent sense for designers to pay attention to. And I want to read you something about touch. I'll just kind of bring it home. 
This is from a, uh, a book that I edited that specialized on the human hand. I remember the first time I touched my wife's hand. It was truly electric, as it still is today. Her skin was warm and smooth. And I don't know how I could sense it, but through her touch I could feel her radiance, warmth, her confidence, and her sense of humor. That first touch instantaneously triggered every one of my cells and immediately created a unique haptic signature that still persists 31 years later. Similarly, I remember how my grandfather's hand felt 24 years ago when he was 92. As I sat on the couch next to him holding his hand, he was tall with thick, calloused hands from the manual labor of a farmer pushing on the end of a shovel, picking apples, or working on his farm all a tractor. And while his hands were large and strong, his touch was gentle. I will also never forget how my memory of his hands changed in an instant when I reached out and I held them as he lay in his casket. In your 10 fingertips, you have over 20,000 specialized receptors. 20,000. Imagine all of the information that is flowing to your brain. There's ones that sense cold, heat, chemical pain, where your fingertips are in space, proprioceptive receptors. It's amazing. You can sense a dot three microns high on a sheet of glass. And to put that in perspective, my wiry gray hair is about 120 microns in diameter. So that's a small dot. I've done products where subjects have felt the difference of a thousandth of an inch in a writing instrument that has transformed the writing instrument to be perfectly fit for my hand or feel like a fence rail. That's an incredible resolution that you have in your fingertips. These are the DNA elements of great design. The things that, when you get them right, it converts an object into something you love. And as a designer, designing for the senses, or what I call synesthetic design, we're able to create premeditated user experiences. We can make things feel masculine, feminine, rugged by manipulating the form and the color and the materials and the textures. And when doing that, we're able to create ownable and unique consumer brand experiences. The ones at the top have a very significant presence in your mind. When you think of virgin, you think of something. Well, I'm sure you think of many things. <laughs> I never thought of that. You think of Apple, you think about all of the touch points, right down to Johnny Ives, who's head of design. He designs the box and the instructions with the same detail that he does on the actual device itself, every touch point. As opposed to Walmart, there's no consumer experience there, you just go there. <laughs> so I want to bring it back now and talk about boomers and civics. And I don't want you to always think about people who are aging. You know, get that metaphor out of your mind of, of an aging, rumpled, crumpled up old person. I want to talk about people like me. I'm a boomer. <laughs> and there's more boomers that are getting spare parts, living longer, and we're really loving life. So it's not like being this age when my dad was, or his dad. It's a different generation. So now I want you to think about the products that we buy for our parents and for ourselves or our grandparents if we need a little bit of help. It's pretty sad. The choices that we have for products is slim. There's very little good design. We go from buying objects of desire to buying objects of necessity. And they really don't make you feel that good. 
This is the state of the art. Right down to the tennis balls, right? <laughs> I can tell you right now, if I walk out of here, trip and fall and break my hip, and I need a walker, I'm not going to feel too good walking over to my Lexus and getting into it with this thing. It's going to remind me how old and how decrepit I am. Now, some of you in this room are old enough to remember the umbrella stroller. It was the same design philosophy. It's, it wasn't really designed for the user experience. It was just there. It performed a function. But now, you can buy strollers that you press a button, they fold themselves up, they have a solar panel so you can charge your cell phone, and they have headlights. <laughs> oh, my God. I can get a Jeep-branded stroller. I can get a three-wheel running stroller. They're all specialized. So why can't we take the design thinking that has transformed that category and apply it to the things on the left? Well, we can. It's just no one is doing it yet. Think about people who have to take care of themselves in their own home. There's very little empathy considered for those users. This lady has MS. When she has to inject herself, she pinches skin, she takes the needle that you see, the syringe, pulls the cap off and holds it in her mouth. Not recommended, by the way, to do it that way, but that's how she is forced to do it because really to use this and inject yourself, you need three hands and 21 fingers. It's really not that fair. And look at all the paraphernalia in the cabinet in the upper right-hand side. Every time she or any of us have to go through this, even sticking your finger if you're a diabetic and taking your blood glucose level, you're reminded, you're reminded of how ill you are. It's not celebrating life. Now, let's get serious, okay? <laughs> How many people here have been in the hospital? Yeah, keep your hand up if you really enjoyed that. <laughs> All right? There's no one with a hand up. What's wrong? 2006, I had a stroke. And I remember my wife and I going into the hospital. And that experience I want to share with you, for those of you who haven't been in a hospital, was just awful. Started out with having a CAT scan, and the doctor came and said, we see something in your brain. We're not sure whether it's been there before or whether it's new. I'll be right back. Hour goes by, two hours go by. Can you imagine what my wife and I were thinking? It was just terrible. And then you start to look around, and I'm laying on a stretcher in a hallway as people are buzzing by. Everything is cold, everything is sterile. There's nothing that I see or experience that doesn't scare the hell out of me. That's not right. One year later, almost to the day, I had a second stroke. And I remember hesitating before I called my wife for help because the thought of going back into the hospital and experiencing that all over again was as bad as having the stroke. This needs help. There's no reason why it needs to be this bad. Now, I remember talking to the doctors and they tried to be really <laughs> empathetic towards me. By the way, how do you tie up those things, you know? <laughs> That's not user design. Now, how many people are looking forward to going into an assisted living facility? Hands up. All right? Is this as good as it gets? Like, kill me now. I'm not going there. You know, to have David Cassidy playing music to me. I know that's not David Cassidy, but if you're tracking David Cassidy, that can be him in about two weeks because his career is going nowhere right now. <laughs> but what's fascinating about this picture is that most of them are asleep, and the lady in the center, she's plugging her ears saying, Stop, would you stop? You're killing me. Right? This is unacceptable as a society. So I want to talk for a moment about how do we really fix all this stuff? What do we do? How does that happen? Well, these are the grandmasters in my lifetime who really got it right more often than got it wrong. 
And what they were capable of doing was taking these, these elements or the, this DNA of great design and manipulating it in certain ways to really create a user experience that was, that was fun, that was uplifting, that was exciting, that makes you want their stuff or experience what they're offering. And they did it by watching and listening because what people say they do and how they really behave is never the same. And they looked at the differences globally and the culturally. But more importantly, when you design things, you need to look at the tribal knowledge. Go back and look at the places where you look and you'll see post-it notes by buttons. Don't press this or do this, then this, then this. Or I've been in surgeries where there's uh, tape covering controls on machines that are used in the, in the suite. So no one presses the button. All of these tics behaviors, all of these oddities of humans are really essential to take into consideration for great design. And no matter what research tool you use, whether it's ethnographic research or interviewing people or covert long lenses to watch them and see how they behave when they really don't know they're being watched, they all have some degree of artifacts. So what you have to do is use multiple tools and techniques and triangulate because everything has an artifact. And keep in mind that we're all different. Look around. We all come in different sizes and shapes, different intellectual capabilities. And it's important to take that in consideration and figure out how we can adapt a design that will be unique for everyone. And when you think about the future, the future is in touch, one of the most potent senses. And keep in mind that we're always on. We're going to be wearing more and more bioinformatic information that's going to be reporting our health status in real time to our clinicians. And algorithms will be paying attention to us and watching. And when we go out of range, we'll get a note on our mobile device. And not only will we be notified that the doctor should see you, it'll tell us what appointments are available and we can book it and move forward. But back to boomers and civics. The size of this population is enormous, and it's growing at an exponential rate. This is not a small cohort, and this is not a small opportunity. And for the guys in this room, it's important to pay attention to the last line on this slide. Nothing's changing there. Women will remain in control, all right, <laughs> which is a good thing. But regardless of what products we're going to seek out into the future, what is important is that simplicity has to be the overlay. I don't know about you guys, but I've got so much information coming at me from so many directions, whether it's voicemail, text messages, Twitter, you know, this, that. Simplicity is important. Make my life easy. And I want the real deal. I'm tired with faux design. I want authenticity, and I want things that really help me that are meaningful to me and my lifestyle. And all of this innovation stuff we're talking about, it's not easy. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. It's heavy lifting. But one thing I want you to keep in mind is that all of you are empowered to make change. You get to vote, and you get to vote at the cash register. So stop buying all of that lousy product stuff for our friends, our family, and ourselves. Pick up the phone, send an email, let the manufacturer know that you're not going to buy their stuff and why. Because when you don't buy it, they don't make money, and then you have their attention. And there's too many products that are eroding our dignity that will not allow us to age with our chin up. And that's what I want, and that's what we all deserve, because dignity is a right of every human. Thanks very much. Thank you.